Now, let's just be honest. Let's just get all the religion out. I hope I've preached a lot of religion out of you this week. Let's just get rid of some religion right now. How many of you would like to live in complete prosperity in every area of your life? Raise your hand. Now, if you don't want to live in prosperity, you can go home now. Save this. Hey, save yourself an hour and go home and watch the baseball game that's coming on tonight. Just do yourself a favor. God created you and made covenant with you through Abraham to be a person of health, wealth, and influence. That's the Abrahamic covenant. Now listen to me. Wealth is relative. Okay, when we talk about being rich, every person sitting in this room is rich. If I put you on an airplane and take you to Nicaragua where we have pastors and churches and feeding centers, every one of you is rich because you make more than a dollar a day. So I don't care if you're living on a fixed income. You're rich. Poverty is a mentality. Prosperity is a mentality. You can live on a fixed income and be a person of prosperity. You can be a billionaire and be a person of poverty. Many of us were raised believing that we should have a poverty mentality. That we should just look, that it would be wrong to have more than enough. Listen, everybody say this with me. Father in heaven, heaven, in Jesus' name, name, I am blessed blessed, and I receive receive tonight tonight prosperity prosperity to have more than enough enough for me and my family and enough left over over to be a blessing. blessing. Now that's God's will for your life. How many of you believe that's God's will for your life? See, when it comes to finances, most Americans in the church are on a financial hamster wheel. They just, every month to month, month to month, just, they just work and live and work and live and spend everything they make and spend sometimes more than they make and they can never get ahead. You know why? Because all money is seed. Everybody say, all money is seed. All money is seed. And most people are eating their seed. And if you eat your seed, it can only become one thing. That's fertilizer. Yeah. You can only do two things with seed. You can sow it or you can eat it. If you sow it, guess what it does? It multiplies. We're going to see that tonight. Here's God's will for your life. Deuteronomy 8, 18. This series, if you'd like to purchase it online, I didn't bring it with me. It's called Upper Class Christianity. Deuteronomy 8.18. And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is He. Everybody say, He's the source. He's the source. It is He who gives you the power. Okay? You, you don't just sit down in your chair and pray for a career, a job, or an opportunity to prosper and hope it falls out of the sky and lands in your lap. If you believe you were created to prosper, you actually pay a price, you learn a trade or you get an education, you do something with what God's given you and put inside of you to let it become the best that it can possibly be because God's given you the power. He is not, he does not possess the power to make you wealthy. He's given you the power to get wealth. Y'all are quiet that he may establish his covenant, which he swore to your fathers as it is to this day. Now, let me, let me give you a Hebrew uh, paraphrase. This is not a literal translation, but I went into the Hebrew language and I researched that verse because the word wealth here is kail in the Hebrew. And kail cannot be translated just into one English word. It takes about five English words to really understand how this word blossoms. The word kail means a lot of different things, but the most accurate translation of the word kail is this, and I want to just read you my paraphrase of this verse. This is what he says in the Hebrew from Deuteronomy 8.18. Take charge of all of the possessions that the Lord your God has given you. Now listen to that. Take charge of all the possessions God's given you. 
How many of you believe that everything belongs to God? That's not true. According to the Hebrew language, it belongs to you. Even the earth belongs to you. The earth is the Lord's and the fullest of but He's given it to who? I told you Sunday morning God's not in control. I know we like to give as a cop out on our responsibility. Well, God's in control. No, He's not because this place is a mess. How many of you would agree you're in control of your finances, not God? Right? You're the one that writes the check or uses the debit card or the credit card or you're the one that purchases or, hey, people get into all kinds of financial trouble and then they pray, God, your big debt cancellation. Well, God gave you sense enough to not get in that kind of debt. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on, smile. Yeah, and you shall remember. He said in the Hebrew, he said, take charge of all of your possessions. Everything that is in your name is your possession, not God's. Now, he did give it to you to steward over it and multiply it, and you will give an account for it. The parable of the talents that I didn't get to this week is 100% a parable about money. 100%. And it was the guy who was stingy, selfish, greedy, and held on to the one talent he got that God cast into outer darkness and said he was evil. Everything God's given you is a possession that you own and control, and he gave it to you so that you multiplied it in his name and for his glory. Take charge of all the possessions that the Lord your God has given you, for he has given you the supernatural status, now watch this, of being his upper class. The word wealth here, kail, is best translated upper class. God created you to be the best that he had to demonstrate who he is in the world. Come on, look at your neighbor right now and say, you're God's upper class. You are. You're God's upper class. One of the things we have to get rid of is, is that, well, you know, I was raised up to believe if somebody had something, then, then, then they probably did something wrong to get it. And it's just, you know, it's just not being a good Christian if you got a whole lot. Where in God's name did you see that in the Bible? Do you understand how rich Jesus was? This is not part of my sermon. Can I tell you how rich Jesus was? Well, the Son of God has nowhere to lay his head. That was an analogy in Hebrew to the Pharisees. Had none to do. Jesus owned a home historically. We've, he owned a home in Capernaum. Jesus wore the most expensive garment that was made that a man could wear. That's why they gambled over it. But watch this. This is not in the sermon, but I'm just going to throw this in for free. Is that all right? Yeah. When those 40, when those 40 magicians, it's not like our magician, those 40 men who studied the stars came from Persia or Iran. They called the wise men. They weren't three. They were 40 at least. And when they came from Iran to Jesus, took them two years to get over there to where he was. They knew how to find him because Daniel had lived with them and Daniel had prophesied to them that they'll watch the stars. When this certain star appears in the sky, it means the Messiah has come. A king of all kings will show up. That was actually the hale -bop comet that appeared in, that gal in our galaxy at that time that Daniel had taught them how to learn and study through biblical astronomy, not astrology. Astrology is from hell. It's Satan's counterfeit. Those men saw the hale -bop comet, knew the Messiah had come, and now watch, and they brought gold, frankincense, and myrrh, and if you do the research on the Hebrew, you'll, you'll understand, they brought a casket-sized box full of gold, a casket-sized box full of frankincense, and a casket-sized box full of myrrh. Jesus financed his life, his parents living in Egypt for two years, and his entire ministry had 70 employees and paid for all of it with what those men brought and put in his possession. So Jesus wasn't broke. Everybody say, it's okay to have money. It's okay to have money. But it's not okay. Come on. But it's not okay for money to have me. Everybody say, money's a tool. It's a seed. Now, take charge of all the possessions the Lord your God's given you, for He has given you the supernatural status of being His upper class on the earth, so that, now hear, hear all the words wrapped up in Kyle, so that through your authority, your wealth, your ability, your strength, 
and your influence, because it takes all those words to, to define Kyle in the Hebrew, through, everybody say it's through my authority, my wealth, my ability, my strength, and my influence that God establishes His kingdom on this earth. That's it. That's what you're here to do. If God created you to be the best employee of a company you can be for all of your life, hallelujah, that company will be blessed. But for some of you, God created you to own the thing. Amen. Now, I can already tell I'm going to get in trouble tonight, but I'm leaving, so. <laughs> Genesis chapter 8, verse 22. Genesis 8, 22. Say this with me out loud. As long as the earth remains. Come on, say it with me out loud. Genesis 8, 22. As long as the earth remains, seed, time, and harvest. Now stop right there. Here's what you have to understand when it comes to money and giving. You have to understand it is a principle written into creation. Sowing and reaping is not a Christian principle. It's not a Jewish principle. It's not a principle of faith. Sowing and reaping is a principle of you do it and creation brings a result. A man who is an atheist can put a grain of corn in the ground and he's going to get a harvest. Right? I know a man that when he was an agnostic, didn't believe in anything, his business tithed to local churches and God blessed his socks off and he didn't even believe in God. It works because it's a law of creation. So go ahead and talk about tithing. Well, tithing's the law or what you're going to teach tonight's the Old Testament. Throw that out of your brain because as long as the earth remains, as long as the earth remains, I didn't write it, I'm reading it to you. As long as there is an earth... There is seed, time, and harvest. Everybody say seed, seed. time, and harvest. Because seed produces harvest. It, it always has, always does. And guess what? If you plant a grain of corn, then what are you going to reap? For whatever a man sows, that's exactly so. If you want money, you have to sow what? just that simple. Now, God is three-dimensional. He is Father, Son, Spirit. He made us in His image. We are three-dimensional. We are body, soul, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Everything in God's creation operates in cycles and seasons, and God operates in threes because that is His being. Anything operating in threes is operating in the nature and image of God. So giving in the Bible was... God operating in these same cycles and seasons. Giving is written in the Word of God in three ways. There are first fruits. Everybody say first fruits. First fruits. If you're taking notes, this would be a good thing to write down. Everybody say first fruits. First fruits. Tithes, plural. Tithes with an S. Tithes. Everybody say tithes. tithes. Don't choke to death. <laughs> there's more than one. So there's first fruits, tithes, and seed offering. Everybody say seed offerings. Seed offering. Now, I came across this truth as I began to research in my research of the Hebrew people. Why is it that Jews make up 4% of the American population and they have 40% of the wealth? Even, even atheist and agnostic Jew. Yeah. Are you listening? Yeah. Almost all Nobel Prize winners have been Jews. The greatest research scientists to discover all sorts of things, including those things right there, were Jews. Albert Einstein yeah. was Jew. Yeah. Do you understand that as a people group or a race, if you want to call it that, there's only two races but as a race, the Hebrew people, there's Jew and Gentile, only two races. And in those two races, there are all kinds of colors. If you go to Israel with me, you're going to see black Jews, brown Jews, tan Jews, white Jews, all kinds of Jews. Just like in Gentiles, we're all red, yellow, white, black, white, or brown. Two races. Well, what you're going to learn is, is as a race, the Jews worldwide have the smallest percentage of their children incarcerated. By far. 
I mean, by far, there's almost no Jews in prison. Why is that? Because they believe in two things. They believe in the law of seed time and harvest, and they believe in the law and principle of blessing. If you're raised in an Orthodox Jewish home, every Friday night at 6 o'clock when the sun goes down at Shabbat, the father or the patriarch of the family lays his hands on every child and says, my son the doctor, my daughter the teacher, my child you're rich, blessed beyond me. He prophesies their future to them. Instead of like so many children in America being slapped over in the corner, say, sit down and shut up, and I'll let you know when I want to hear from you, and being treated like somebody that has no identity. That's what's wrong with our kids today. They don't have anybody to prophesy a blessing into their life. Now watch. So, let's talk about first fruits. We're going to talk about all these tonight. Let's talk about first fruits. First fruits, number one, are not the tithe. Most church people have been taught all their life that the tithe is first fruit. Well, they're not the same thing, and I'll prove that to you. Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 44. At the same time, some were appointed over the rooms of the storehouse. Watch this. What was in the storehouse? Offerings, first fruits, and tithes. So there's a difference between tithes and first fruits and offerings. Number two, who did they give first fruits to? First fruits were given to the spiritual authority over them. In Deuteronomy chapter 18, verse 3. And this shall be the priest. Everybody say the pastor. This is the pastor or the apostle. In my case, in Pastor Bob's case, in Pastor Tony's case, we have an apostle. Whoever is in spiritual authority over you is who first fruits is given to. And this is right here in the scripture. In Nehemiah chapter 12, verse 44, I'm sorry, Deuteronomy 18, 3, this is the priest due from the people, from those who offer a sacrifice, whether it's a bull or a sheep, they shall give the priest the shoulder, the cheeks, the stomach, and the first fruits, everybody say first fruits, first fruits, of your grain and your new wine and your oil and the first of the fleece of your sheep you shall give him. For the Lord's chosen him out of all the tribes that stand over you. I'm not going to read the rest of it for time's sake. So first fruits is not a tithe. First fruits belongs to the man or woman of God who is over you, your spiritual authority. Number three, first fruits guarantees increase. First fruits guarantees increase. Look at Nehemiah chapter 10, verse 35. Let me just, for the sake of time, let's look at verse 36, and I'm reading this out of the One New Man Bible, but it'll be close. Let's, and to bring the first fruits of our ground and the first fruits of all fruit of a tree year by year to the house of the Lord. Verse 37, also the firstborn of our sons, cattle, as it is written in the Torah teaching, the, fr the firstlings of our herds and flocks to bring to the house of our God to the priests that minister in the house of God. Something happens in, in Israel, in the Old Testament, the New Testament, even today, something happens in the Hebrew culture. Every male you know is required to go to Jerusalem at Passover, Pentecost, and Tabernacles. Every male is required to not come empty-handed. What did he bring when he came? Well, at Passover, it was the barley harvest, and at Pentecost, it was the wheat harvest, and at Tabernacles, it is the, the fruit and nut harvest, plus the animal harvest from their uh, crops, from their herds. So they would bring Passover, Pentecost, Tabernacles, a sacrifice of blood, an animal, they would bring barley in the first feast. They would bring wheat in the second feast. They would bring grain and fruit in the third feast, along with their animal. Now watch. They're bringing this to the priest because, just take the barley harvest, for example. There's what's called the oblation. And they would bring the grain to the priest. And the priest would take the grain, grind it up, and make bread. How many of you have ever heard of a wave offering? Well, in a Pentecost church, a wave offering is give the Lord a wave offering. That's not what it means. It's okay to do that. The wave offering is the priest would take the bread from the first fruits of the grain of that farmer and take the loaf of bread and wave it before the Lord. And when he did this, he lifted it up before God and said, this man has given his first fruits to your person of authority who covers him. Therefore, this puts a demand on you and your word to guarantee his harvest doesn't fail. 
When you take care of the man of God, it puts a demand on God's authority and his word to take care of your harvest. See, the way this came about is that when the crop was heading out, if it was a barley or if it was wheat, now I'm from Arkansas and we grew a lot of wheat there. And when the wheat starts heading out, how many of you know what I'm talking about? The farmer would call the local priest. The priest would go out to the farm and conduct what's called the bickering. The bickering in Hebrew is he would go out and estimate how much wheat was going to be harvested off this crop. Now in Arkansas right now, they just finished cutting rice and they're probably about finished with soybeans. Arkansas is the number one rice producer in the United States. Most people don't know that. And we grow rice in Arkansas at the scale of 200 bushels an acre, which is just world-renowned amazing. So priests would come out and say, Farmer John here has got 1,000 acres of rice, and he's going to produce 200 bushels. Now here's the deal, farmer. You can give me the first fruits off this rice for my family so we have something to eat. First fruits was 1 40th to 1 60th of the crop. The priest would say, now, farmer, how much, how much rice do you think you're going to produce an acre? He said, well, 200 bushels. Okay, so here's the deal. We're going to believe God for 200 bushels an acre off this field. You're going to give my family between 1 40th and 1 60th of this crop. And if you agree to do that and come in covenant with God, it puts a demand on God to make sure you get 200 bushels off this thousand acres. 200 bushels an acre. That's how it works. When you... So teruma, that's the Hebrew word for first fruits, teruma. When you sow teruma into the man or woman of God that's covering you, it puts a demand on God to guarantee your harvest. I'll prove that to you in Proverbs chapter number three, verse nine. Honor Adonai with your wealth and the first fruits of all of your income. Then, everybody say then. Then, then your granaries will be filled and your vats will overflow with new wine. You give the priest's family between 1.7 and 2.5%. That's the percentage. It's not earth shattering. Most of you spend more than that at Starbucks. Hello. Come on, look at your neighbor and say he's meddling now. Why is this important to God? Well, because your first fruits offering sanctifies everything else in your life. It says to God that I honor authority. I honor the man of God. I honor the fact that that man's giving account for my soul and my family standing in the gap. Look at, look at Romans chapter 11, verse 16. Now we're going to go to the New Testament. If the first fruit is holy, the lump is also holy. And if the root is holy, so are the branches. What's Paul talking about? When you sow first fruits and sanctify it as holy to the man of God, then it makes everything else in your life sanctified and set apart for God's glory. Now look, in uh, Galatians chapter 6, first fruits was carried over in the New Testament. Somebody said, well, that's Old Testament. Well, here it is in the New Testament, Galatians 6, 6. But whoever's being instructed in the Word... How many of you attend either this church, my church, or some church, and you get instructed on Sunday and Wednesday in the Word? How many of you go to church somewhere and you hear a sermon? Look at what God says. If you're being instructed in the Word, you should share all the good things with your instructor. 1 Timothy 5.17. I'm really going to make you mad now if I'm not careful. Look here. 1 Timothy 5, 17, And let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. Can I tell you what that verse says? It says the pastor of a church, the apostle of a ministry, should make twice as much money as the richest person in the church. Oh, hallelujah. Thank you. <laughs> Everybody say Double. Last time I checked in the Greek, you know what double means? Double. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me. I grew up, my father's 79 and he's still pastoring. And he'll pastor until he dies. And he started this church 23 years ago and they came to him recently, his health's getting bad, and said, you're the pastor of this church. 
This is your church. It's a Southern Baptist church, which makes this a miracle. But they came to him and said, we're going we're gonna to take care of you and pay you as long as you're alive. If you never preach another sermon in this church, we're going to take care of you. How many of you know God will honor that church? Yes, but one of the reasons my dad never retired is because he couldn't, because the Southern Baptist churches he pastored all his life believe in keeping the preacher poor and humble and broke. Yes, sir. I mean, one of the reasons I didn't want to be going to ministry, God started calling me at 16, is I didn't want to be that poor. What does it say to God when you look at the people he picked to be over you? spiritually, in your family, that they can't even live at the same level as the average church member, much less above. Hey, I love sports. I love your jersey, by the way, but I'm a Yankee fan. Anyway, God will forgive me. But look, I love sports. But do you understand the Yankees went and got a guy and paid him $30 million a year to hit about 30 some odd home runs this year. He's hitting a little white ball 400 feet 30 times making 30. Do the math on that. Hey, I love, I love, you know, basketball and football and I don't begrudge those guys for making whatever they can make. But I think that our country would be in a different position spiritually if the most wealthy influential, powerful people in America were pastors and governors and mayors and congressmen would call and contact the pastors to say, what does God want us to do? Because ladies and gentlemen, when the Bible says your gift will make room for you, that wasn't talking about the gift of tongues. That was talking about money. You look it up in the Hebrew. Your gift, your ability in wealth will, listen, you got enough money, you'll get invited to go meet Donald Trump. Right? All of my life, growing up with a poverty mentality, I looked at these rich preachers on TV. And listen, and I've, I've had to repent because I didn't know anything about them. And I just said, well, you know what? I just think that's too much. I just don't think they ought to have that kind of money. You better be careful. You can never have what you criticize. And then I became spirit-filled. And then I actually got to meet some of these people. And I found out they're the biggest givers I've ever met in my life. Every time Ryan Hart Bonnke preaches a crusade to three million people in Africa, Kenneth Copeland writes the check for the entire crusade. I don't think I'd criticize him. He's almost a billionaire. I think Kenneth Copeland being a billionaire would be much better than George Soros being a billionaire. Oh, amen. Amen. Well, I just don't think a preacher ought to have all that. Well, God didn't ask you. I'm sorry, I'm not trying to be cute or smart or sarcastic. I'm, I, but, hey, Jesse Duplantis is the richest man in New Orleans. I was telling him today, he bought the staircase from the Gone with the Wind movie and built his house around it. Why is that significant? Because the city of New Orleans has been controlled by mafia and Catholicism, but now they don't do anything without asking Jesse first. Your gift will make room for you. Yeah. Hear me. If these men of God are two of the richest men in this region, they will wield influence over the government officials and have a voice. I'm going to get to your wealth in a minute. I'm talking about them first. Because here's the deal. Blessings trickle down. If these men are highly favored and blessed, it comes down on your life. So, whoo, I'm in deep now. Let's move on quickly. <laughs> Taruma. What is Taruma? It's between 1.7 and 2.5% of your income. And according to the Bible, you should give it to the man of God or the woman of God that teaches you the word. You think this is hard for me to preach. The first time I learned this and had to stand up and preach it to my own people, and I'm telling them there's so money into me. That's pretty tough. But I did. After I'd been practicing it. I've been sowing Taruma into Dr. Ron Phillips for a long time. You know what happened in my life when I started sowing Taruma? 
My income went up 500%. Do the math. Five. I didn't say five. I didn't say five. I said 500%. Y'all are quiet. Hmm. Now let's get to you. Let's talk about tithes. Everybody say tithes. tithes. There are three. I heard a giant sucking sound from somewhere. <laughs> <laughs> Pastor, I can't even tithe, much less tithes. Well, because you're eating your seed. Look here. In Malachi chapter 3, verse 8, can a person rob God? Yes. You have robbed me. How? We've robbed you in tenths. The complete Jewish Bible says tenths. The word is tithes, it's plural. Now watch, there are three tithes. The first tithe is the Mashir Rashan in Hebrew, Mashir Rashan. That 10% of your income, and yes, it's your gross income, because you tithe off of everything built into your possession. My dad was such a stickler for tithing, and thank God for it, I had to tithe off my birthday money. <laughs> You're looking at a man who has tithed. Listen, I may have failed God in lots of ways, but I've tithed as early as I can remember. I'm talking about five years old, get a dollar from Mama, and you got to put a dime in Sunday school on Sunday. Thank God for it. Yeah. 10% of your gross income belongs to the house of God. The storehouse. The second tithe, God's not stingy. The second tithe belongs to you. In the Hebrew culture, the Mashir Rishon belongs to the house of God or the, or the storehouse. The Mashir Shanai belongs to you. Mashir Shanai means you tithe to yourself. If you're any kind of person at all, you need to take 10% of everything you make and put it up. Save it. Drive that car five more years and save it. Yeah. Do you remember when the Bible says that a good man leaves an inheritance to his children's children? Yeah. And the wealth of the wicked has been laid up for the righteous? Yes. A good man leaves an inheritance, watch this now, to his children's children. That means I got four grandbabies. My kids ain't getting nothing. I'm leaving it all to my grandchildren. <laughs> Your children's children. No, what it means is this is that when a Jewish man dies, he's made enough wealth in his lifetime for three generations to live on it and never have to work again. That's why they're rich. But he teaches his son, you never touch this principle, son. You go work and you keep adding to it and your son keeps adding to it and your son keeps adding to it. And that's why they own the world. Do you know where taxes came from? Do you know why we have taxes? the United States of America, because we patterned our form of government after Rome. And you know why Rome created taxes? Because they owned the Jews and they were going broke, but the Jews had money to spend. Their slaves had money galore and they're going under. So they taxed the Jews to keep them from being able to sow into God's kingdom. Doesn't it make sense to you that if God's people would have just tithed and would have tithed to themselves, that the government wouldn't be our God and the house of God would be feeding widows and orphans yeah. and providing health care yeah. and being the, 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 denominant, the, the, the dominant factor in the world? Amen. I'm convinced the reason that America's in the financial mess we're in is because 3% of Americans actually tithe to their church. 3%. That's all denominations. Well, let's talk about evangelicals. 23%. If you pastor a really good church today, 40% of your people tithe. We've brought a curse upon ourselves because we've given more money to government than God. Right? Have you figured out God doesn't need your money? God needs your obedience so He can bless you. Amen. Now, the third tithe is the Mashir Anai in Hebrew, and it is alms to the poor. The Mashir Anai is this. Every third month or four times a year, a Jewish person would take the tithe that they store up for themselves and they would give it to the poor to feed the widows, feed the orphans, take care of the homeless, so watch, 10% belongs to the house of God, 10% belongs to you. Every third month, 10% belongs to the poor. 
two and a half percent belongs to the man of God. You say, Pastor, those numbers are adding up pretty big in my life. An orthodox practicing Jewish person who does not believe Jesus is the Messiah will give away between 35 and 50 percent of their income every year. Well, my goodness gracious, what does that mean? It means you learn to live on less. It means you actually believe Jesus when he said, store up treasures in heaven and not on earth. I'll make you this promise. If you practice what I'm preaching tonight, you'll have more than you can spend. I'm telling you, you will. Because you can't outgive God. I'm not here to get you to do this. I'm here to present a truth to you and give you an opportunity to obey God and get the daylights blessed out of your life. Now watch. I'm going to skip all that. We're running out of time. Now, your tithe to the house of God, to yourself, and to the poor is not seed. Your tithe is fruit. When God blesses your life, we've got 10 apples, and I'm sure they were grown right here. These aren't Walmart apples, are they? (laughs) Don't say. It's all right. So, We got the sum total of everything that your life's blessed with financially right here. You live off of the fruit. Your seed is what's in the fruit. And we're going to get to that at the end. But watch this. Here's God's plan. That as long as He gives seed to the sower, Isaiah 55 and 2 Corinthians 9, Isaiah 55, 10, in 2 Corinthians 9, 10, as long as God gives you fruit, which is your income, your financial blessing, inside everything God gives you, there's a portion, and they're called seed. And He gives seed so that you can be a sower. Because a sower is guaranteed seed, time, and harvest. Which means if you take from the fruit of your life and you always sow, you never run out of harvest. It's not rocket science. If you eat your seed, it's fertilizer. If you sow your seed, it's the next year's harvest. Now, he gives seed to the sower and bread to the eater. And multiplication comes into your life. So now let's talk about the seed. Look at how God's economy works. First fruits to the man of God guarantees increase in your life. It means you never can lose your harvest. Tithes to the house of God to yourself, and to the poor guarantees abundance. Seed is where we get a guarantee of supernatural blessing. Supernatural blessing. Remember Proverbs 3, 9? I read Proverbs 3, 9. Listen to it again. Honor Adonai with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your income. Then your granaries, what is grain? What is grain? Seed. Your granaries will be filled, meaning you're going to have more seed than you can plant. Your granaries will be filled, and your vats will overflow with new wine. Now, I'm close to being finished. Everybody say, praise God. (laughs) True story. A man in Apostle Ron Phillips' church heard me teach this years ago. This man and his wife owned a uh, cleaning business, just the two of them. They would go in after hours and clean banks and schools, et cetera, et cetera, working themselves to death. He heard me teach this. He started sowing the 2% to Pastor Ron's ministry, not the church, but him personally, his personal ministry. Started sowing. A year later, that 100 employees. Thank you for that praise the Lord. Y'all are all looking at me like a calf looking at the new gate. Hey. I can tell you story after story after story of people that started doing this, that their life is so financially blessed. I'm telling you, maybe I'll think of some more of them. I don't have them written down. Now watch. This is, this is what God has put in your possession. This is the sum total of your wealth right here. This is what you make. If you listen to what I said tonight, then 
That one right there belongs to God, to his house. And that leaves you nine. That one right there belongs to your children's children, to you. That leaves you eight. When we talk about Taruma, okay, we're talking about at the most 2.5% that belongs to the man of God. Now, you have a choice now out of what remains. Are you listening? Because inside all of this, inside of this is what? Well, that one right there, I cut it. Let me see if I can find one. Do you all not have seeds in your apples out here? Y'all going to run out of apples. <laughs> wow. Where is the seed at? Where did these come from? I'm telling you right now. Walmart. That's the problem. Came Walmart. These, these apples came from Washington State, not from Virginia. Look at there. There's one right there finally. Thank God. Now, what is that I hold in my hand? Seed. No, it's not. It's an orchard. Oh, an orchard. Because if you eat that right there, it's, fidget, it's over. It's done all it can do. It's fertilizer. If you plant that right there, what's it going to produce? A tree that's going to have how many more of those? And inside each one of those, how many more of these? And inside all of those, how many more? You see, how many of you have read the Bible where it talks about Receiving a 30, 60, and 100 fold blessing. Yes, sir. That's not a percentage. That's not a percentage. I have one handkerchief. If I fold it one time, I have two. That's one fold. If I fold it two times, I have four. That's fourfold. If I fold it again, I have 16. If I fold it again, I have 32. How much is a hundredfold? Well, I got a hundred percent return from what I sowed. Well, that ain't even close to a hundredfold. You sow a thousand dollars. The hundredfold on a thousand dollars is in the millions. The millions. That's the power of seed. Are you listening? Yes, sir. That's the power of seed. I'm getting hungry looking at those apples. <laughs> you got to help me. Sweetheart, playing the guitar. What's your name, darling? Caitlin. Caitlin, come here. Come right here. If you learn this concept, if you just stand right, if you learn this concept, <laughs> listen, because see, in everything you have, you've got seed. And if you learn this concept and you learn how to be sensitive to the Holy Spirit, I love sowing seed because I'll just be in a restaurant and the Holy Spirit will say, buy that person's meal or bless this waitress. I'm going to say something that is really going to cause revival not to come tonight, okay? <laughs> I dare you to go into a restaurant Especially on Sunday. Because that's the day that waiters and waitresses hate to work because God's people are the stingiest people on earth. I dare you to go to a restaurant on Sunday and meet your waitress and she's a single mom. I dare you to tip her more than your bill. Jesse Duplantis told this story just the other day. I was with him and he told this story on television in Little Rock. He said, he said, I was in this restaurant. He said, now, when I go to a restaurant in New Orleans and there's a line five miles long and they see me coming, Brother Jesse, we've got your table. <laughs> he said, I don't have to wait. He said, I, I was eating in this restaurant in New Orleans and I, the Holy Spirit told me to give this young lady a $1,500 tip. That'd be a good night, wouldn't it? But you got to have it to give it. 
He said, I sowed that into her, told her the Lord told me to give it to her. She came back. Next time I was in that restaurant, she said, you didn't know it, but I had applied to nursing school and I needed $1,500 to finish the application. He said, I'm sowing seed into a nurse. When Amy and I were on our honeymoon in uh, Jamaica, we had uh, the couple's massage thing. And she said, I believe we're supposed to tip these ladies this amount of money. I said, okay. So before we left, one of the ladies came to her and said, I was applying for a job in the Cayman Islands, but I didn't have the money to finish the paperwork for my daughter so I could take her with me. And what y'all tipped me was exactly the amount of money I needed. God. See, that's what seed is. That's what seed is. And you can't lose that harvest. Caitlin? You look like you're on Let's Make a Deal or something here. <laughs> you're just excited. You probably don't even know what that is. No. I have in my hands. Now look, here's the deal. Just imagine, just imagine that I am the Holy Spirit. I'm not, but just for sake of this illustration, I'm the Holy Spirit, I'm God. And I look at Caitlin and I say, you know, I believe this young lady will believe me I believe she'll obey me. Caitlin, I have in my hands, and it is mine to give, I have $100 in various bills. And because I know you will obey, I want to give that to you tonight if, if I can trust you to obey what God has said to do. Will you take it? Will you take it on the terms that you'll obey what I tell you to do with it? Yeah. Okay. Okay, now... If you're going to tithe off that $100, how much belongs to the church? Ten. Put 10. I got a $10 bill in there somewhere from some fives. That belongs to the church. Okay. Now, God says that Taruma, or 1.725%, to belongs to your pastor. So $2 belongs to Brother Bob. Okay. Go over and give it to him. Not, <laughs> don't put it there. <laughs> now, this is the way that I try to tell people to do this because the math becomes very confusing. We don't live under the law. We do keep the feasts at my church, but I tell people, do the taruma, do the tithe, do the alms as you get paid. Don't wait for the three times a year because you just, you'll just lose the math. So a tithe to yourself then is how much? $10. Now you're going to put that toward uh, your, your nursing career. Okay, you're going to put that up for your nursing career. And then alms to the poor in a quarter would be a, roughly $9, but we're going to give it as we make it. So $3 belongs to, and look here, you take $3, go give to, I don't care who you give, go give to anybody. I'll just go give to somebody. Not your brothers. Not your brothers. <laughs> look, Kevin got saved over there Sunday morning. Go give three about three dollars to Kevin. Go give three dollars to Kevin. Now, how much money you got left? Count it. Seventy-five dollars. Twenty-five percent of your income to do the minimum of what God tells you to do in the Bible. Now, that's the minimum a practicing Hebrew person will do much more than that, 35 to 50. Now, a lot of that they're going to put in the savings account for themselves. I'm not saying they're not. But my point is this, is that there are people out there that can't do this. They, I mean, financially, on their income, the economy, fixed in, there, I know people that cannot do this. But most of the people that I know that really can't do this actually do this. Because they believe God. I've learned in 33 years, Pastor Bob, and when I get to heaven, I got a bone to pick with, with Jesus Christ. I, I've, I've got one. I've got a lot, but I've got one big one. Pastor, I'm being transparent here tonight. I'm being honest. I went to the Lord the other day. I said, God, I don't get it. The people in my churches that I've pastored through all these years who have the most money, 
give the least. And I want to know why in heaven's name you gave it to them. And he said, well, number one, maybe I didn't give it to them. Maybe the devil did. He said, but even if I did give it to them, remember one thing. They're going to have their whole reward down here and they'll have nothing in heaven. Because they're going to give an account for every dime. So that made me feel a little bit better, but not much. <laughs> so here's the thing. Pick up that 10, because that's for your future. So you get to keep 85 bucks out of the 100. Give her a hand. God bless you. <laughs> Just leave it right there. Now, when we were here in May, how many of you were here and heard Pastor Todd Zeiger teach in May? Anybody? Yeah. Where were y'all? We missed you. Pastor Todd Zeiger has a teaching about taking seed. And I'm just telling you, there wasn't but one seed in that apple. That apple was cheap. I'm just telling you straight up. Maybe there's, Pastor Zeiger, there's one more, look at there, taught on Building a memorial before God. And here's what he taught us. And he just came to my church and did this. And I put, took the single largest offering we've ever had in our two-year existence. I mean, it was phenomenal. You remember a Gentile named Cornelius in Acts 10? You remember? How many of you ever heard of Cornelius? God gave Cornelius the desires of his heart. They got saved, his whole family, household, baptized in the Holy Ghost. Yeah. And you know why? He said, because I have seen your faith yeah. in your giving, and I've heard your prayer. Mm -hmm. When you take seed and you take the Word and you put them together, you name that seed, it puts a demand on God to bring the harvest. Cornelius and his whole house got saved, filled with the Holy Ghost as Gentiles because he sowed seed and he prayed and he wasn't even a believer. When Pastor Todd, and I don't think he'll mind me sharing this, and I'm not going into detail his personal business, but when Pastor Todd and Lori were here with us in May, we came downstairs to come to service and he said, uh, Lori and I would like to talk to you and Amy and I said, okay. He said, we have a big need in our life. It's, a, it's a really a major, we need a miracle, a big miracle. And they shared what it was, and that's his business. And said, uh, we want to build a memorial into your life, into this good soil, and we want to claim that this thing's done. Listen, he got home from this meeting, and the situation got worse. But they stood on that word. Because see, when you got seed in the ground and you got faith in the, in, in, in the Word, listen, when you got seed and faith, your circumstances don't dictate the outcome. And he just kept speaking to that need and said, look, I've got seed and I've got a confession over the seed and it has to happen. Well, in no time, they received their miracle. It was a supernatural miracle. It was a transformation of a life of someone they loved. And I'm telling you, and then when he was just with us at our church, you can't believe how God turned that situation. And it happened right here. Here's what I want to ask you to do tonight. I want to ask you to sow a seed of faith that amounts between you and God. We're not talking about Taruma. If you want to practice first fruits, Take 2% of your income and start sowing it into Bob Vineyard Ministries, BVM. And he'll use it for the glory of God to go to Cuba and mission work and everything else. And you can still get a tax deduction. 2%, start doing that. 10% here, 10% to yourself. You've got ministries that minister to hurting people out of this church. You've got all kinds of ministries out of this church. And Pastor Tony's ministry feeds, 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 and feeds people. Start giving that tithe to ministries to poor and hurting people. But I'm asking you tonight for a seed offering. 
The amount's between you and God. I don't know what to tell you to do. But I will tell you this, for every person that sows something and builds a memorial and names it, you're going to get a miracle. Because you put a demand on God's word and he has to keep his word or he's a liar. Can I tell you how I pray? Now you're really going to think that I'm arrogant and I'm not. But I so believe in God's word and what he says. I go to God and I tell him, look, I can't fail. Because I got seed in the ground and I've got it named. And if I go under, you're a liar and your word's not true. Well, I can't believe you talk to God like that. Well, he's not bothered by that. As a matter of fact, I tell him when I get ticked off. Y'all are looking at me so holy. You ain't never been mad at God. Well, I don't just get mad at him. I tell him I'm mad at him. He's up there like, build a bridge and get over it, boy. Right? So I want you to bow your head. And I want you to ask the Holy Spirit what you should sow tonight. For a need you have in your life. It might be for a loved one that needs to be saved. It might be for someone that needs a healing. I preached this years ago and a couple came to me after the service and said, we're going to sow $200. That's what the Lord told us. Because we have a son that's on drugs and we don't know where he's at. We don't know if he's dead or alive. We haven't heard from him in five years. We're going to sow this $200 seed and believe that our son is going to come home. They sowed that seed, and within two weeks, I got a letter, a phone call or something. The son showed up on their doorstep and then was introduced to Teen Challenge, got delivered, saved, serving, serving God today. This works because... It puts God's authority and his word on the line. Do you need a new job? Do you need a financial miracle? Do you need healing? Do you need a family member touched? What do you need in your life? I suppose if you don't have any need whatsoever, then you shouldn't participate. In that same meeting, those people sowed that $200. I watched a young man and his wife walk down to the, they brought out a five gallon bucket to take the offering in. I'd never seen that. It was a country church over in the mountains of Arkansas. These people were poor. When I got there that night, I said, Lord, are you sure you want me to preach this to these folks? These people are poor. He said, they need it more than anybody. I watched this young man and his wife come to the altar and he had tattoos and piercings everywhere. And they took a handful of change and they dropped it in that bucket. I said, son, how long have you been saved? He said, six months. I said, what are you praying for? He said, a job. He said, I've been in prison. Dealt drugs, took drugs. I'm out and I'm clean, got saved. He said, I need a job. Nobody hire me. I said, if you don't mind me asking how much money did you put in that bucket? He said, $2.67. That's all we got. He said, we're not even sure we got enough gas to get home. I said, here's the deal. He said, I'm going for an interview tomorrow with a roofer to go to work roofing houses. I said, that job's yours. He looked at me. I said, that job is yours. You need to go to that roofer tomorrow and say, sir, I sowed a seed last night in the house of God, and God promised me this job's mine. He came back to church that next night. I said, did you get the job? He said, yes, sir, I got the job. I said, well, you not only got a job, but you got this. And I handed him a check for $267. I said, there's a 100% return on your seed. Now take it and be blessed. Man, he started crying. Listen, this works. This works. What do you need? Holy Spirit, speak to God. Speak to your people. Speak to your people, Holy Spirit.